Yep, my name's Ali McLeod and I've been fishing off and on, mainly on, for 40 odd years now. Um, I left school early before going to college and spent a year's, a season's fishing for Langustine uh, creel fishing. In 1977, February 1977, that's when I first started. And uh, through going to college and bits and bobs, we eventually bought my own boat, my first boat in 1984. And since then, we've been fishing solidly since then. And always creel fishing. We spent uh, two weeks of my fishing career on a trawler. Um, and I've always sort of thought that trawling wasn't quite the right way to fish, certainly in the inshore waters in the west coast of Scotland. Um, and probably these two weeks confirmed it. Um, just seeing what came up in the nets, just the, the number of small langoustine that were, you know, just tiny baby langoustine that were dead on the deck. And, uh, you know, in the 40 years I've been creeling, I've never seen so many dead, wasted langoustine in the 40 years that I did in these two weeks. So I've always had that uh, sort of, you know, sort of feeling about creel fishing as being sustainable. And uh, when we pull up other sea life in the creels, we can put them back over the side and everything is still alive as it goes back into the water. Uh, sometimes you pull up fish that the bladders are, are blown and yeah, they don't survive, but you know, the gulls or the gannets get them. Uh, but generally about 95% of the sea life that we don't want or sell to sell, you know, we can return to the water. And it's just a, I feel it's a good way to fish. You know, you're, you're cropping, you're cropping reasonably. Um, and you've been doing that for 40 odd years. Yeah, for, for some reason, it's, it's very cyclical. Um, you know, we get um, peaks and troughs all the way, but we've it's it's quite interesting this summer we've i've seen a peak that i haven't seen for about 10 15 years but it's there seems to be a general decline um when i first went fishing i had i went fishing with a partner and she was on board as well and we had 300 creels and we hauled them every day and if they were lying over the weekend we got an extra fishing on the monday um now I've got 900 creels and I haul them maybe once a week because there's not enough langoustine on the bottom to, to haul them every day. So you have to leave them what we call a soak time. And uh, if you leave them maybe two or three days, you tend to get a bigger langoustine in the creels. So it's, it's, it's quite good financially and you're not taking all the small stuff all the time. And I think there's langoustine that come in and out of the creels it's the, the the good thing about it is it's it's a passive type of fishing it's it's not the aggressive trawl or dredge um it's a creel sitting on the bottom it's got a bait in the middle and it's the prawn you need a good stock of langoustine for it to be successful and it seems to be okay at the moment um but we have seen a lot less pressure in the local waters here i haven't seen a trawler for two years we've got a no fish zone here which is it's, you know, an unintended consequence in the fact that it's a no-fish zone because the MOD don't want us to work that water. But that also means that no one catches langoustine in that in these waters. So the waters round about that no-fish zone um, tends to be richer because no one's catching the, the langoustine in the no-fish zone, so it becomes a bit overcrowded and the langoustine move out into waters that we're fishing in. Also, around that no fish zone, there's a no trawl zone, and to the north of us is a no trawl zone, and I think that's helping us. And we get some lovely big langoustine, and the waters just off the the the, the Albacore's Bay, and it's it's sustainable, in that if you don't want too much, um, I'm sort of a wee bit strange amongst fishermen. When the fishing's good, I come in early because I catch, what I've developed my own market. And once I know that that market is full, I can come in. And if the if the Apple Crescent is selling my langoustine for about maybe 10 months of the year, I know I'm making a good wage. And that's it. And there's, there's, there's a saying that 
I don't, I don't know if I've heard it or I just thought it, but I think the best fisherman is not the guy that catches the most fish. He's the guy that's happiest catching the least because he can leave some for the next generation to catch. And so what the boys now that are catching langoustine, they're trying to look to the future and they're trying to put limits on ourselves to keep the fishery going. Um, and, you know, if you get a good price for quality langoustine, it means you don't have to catch quite so many. So whereas it, it's it's not a bulk fishery, it's it's a it's a top end of the market niche fishery, um, and people eat them for um, not every day. It's 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 not like a, a meat and tatties dish. It's a speciality, and people do want to eat them. And we've run out of langoustine in the pub today, so I'm out fishing again tomorrow to catch to start again for the week. Over the years, um, I suppose my practices have changed as my needs have become less and the fact that I've got no mortgage in my boat and, and I wouldn't criticise any of the younger boys that really have to push to pay off the boats and pay off their houses and raise a family and that. Um, it's just you can do it if you've got a long-term outlook. Um, you can do it in a sustainable way. For example, I don't land any of the female langoustine that, that hold the berries in their tails. Um, I put them back, I put 100% of them back. Now, I think that helps the fishery because if you, if you keep them on board and sell them, you know for a fact that these eggs will never become langoustine. Whereas if you put them back in the water, it is proven that they do survive. So they come up through the water in the creel, they come to your deck and you put them straight back into the water and you're releasing re-releasing a female with buried prawns. Now, even if one prawn comes from that bunch of, say, 200 berries in the tail, at least you're, you're, you're sort of giving something back to the fishery. And to be quite honest, you know, if, if you're the guy that catches the most prawns, so what? You know, it's, it's like saying, I don't know, uh, Richard Branson or Donald Trump is a better person than the guy that works for him, uh, which in my world, that doesn't, it, it, it's not an indication of how good or how bad someone is uh, and based on wealth. Um, if you can live within your environment, and that's what I've grown into trying to do. Um, and, and yeah, at the moment, um, you'll see me putting back, I would say, about 30% of my catch. But at the same time, I don't lack for anything. You know, I've, I've, I've got everything I want. Um, I'm able to take time off, I'm able to enjoy my music, I'm able to take photographs, write a blog, do anything I want. Um, and if I landed these female prawns with the berries, yeah, so what? Uh, but putting them back in the water means a lot. Uh, it means a lot to me. Knowing that other fishermen don't do that doesn't bother me that much now because that's... I sort of say that that's their problem. If they don't think that's something that they should be doing, well, maybe if the fishery goes down, declines even more, the legislators may have to come in. But I would rather the fishermen see it themselves um, and, and carry out the practices that we carry out. The Creole men, the, 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 the boys that work in my industry, we tend to catch less small prawns than, say, a trawler does. Um, and we catch a lot less sea life than the troll. Uh, so just be by being a creole man, uh, even if you do land the female prawns, it's 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 okay. You know, it's uh, it's it's fine. It's it's been done for years, but there has been a, a quite a, a strong number of of creole fishermen that have always put back the buried females, um, and I'd just like to be part of that. You know, I would like to see the next generation catch langoustine and enjoy the life I've had. We don't seem to, just human frailty, you know, we don't seem to learn from past mistakes. You know, the, the, the herring on the West Coast is a classic example of how not to manage a fishery. Uh, my dad and my grandfather were herring fishermen. Um, there's very, very few uh, boys that fish for herring now. They're all in huge purse netters, whereas the herring was done by... If, by, first by drift net 
then it went on to a ring net, and then went on to the purse scene net. And the technology outran the environment, and the technology has always got to be capped, uh, because we, we, we can basically wipe out everything that we're catching. Uh, we, we've got the technology to do it. So we have to have something else that holds us back, that outgrows, we just seem to outgrow our, our environment. And when you think of it, we're catching shellfish, which are, um, they're, they're, they're animals that are just running along the bottom of the seabed, eating detrius that falls through the food chain, that falls through the water column. And they're scavengers. Now we've, we've fished out the cod, the haddock, the hake, the herring, the, there's some mackerel out there, but not in commercial quantities. Um, that's, that's all been fished out. We're, we're right at the bottom of the chain. And now some places off the American coast in Mexican Gulf, we're hearing they're catching jellyfish. Now jellyfish are single cell plankton, you know, that, but the Japanese eat jellyfish salads. Now there's guys that are taking thousand dollar hauls of jellyfish or spending a whole day catching shrimp and they fished out the shrimp and the shrimp are the guys that are just running around the bottom just catching the, the little bits, eating the little bits of stuff. So we, we've got nowhere else to go. If we don't redress the balance and actually get the white fish back as well as keeping the prawns and the, the, the langoustine, the crab, the lobster, if we look after that and get the white fish back, we take pressure off this, the, the, what, what we're doing, you know, with the, with the scallops, the, 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 all that shellfish, and we can take some boats away from catching shellfish, 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 and actually get onto the, back onto cod and haddock, and skate maybe, and using lines instead of trawling. And that would almost rebirth the, the inshore waters in the, in the, in the west of Scotland. You know, it's, it's, it's lovely to hear tales of people that are still alive and there's a guy that's 90 year old and he's living down the village and he tells me that 50 years ago he would go out in this dinghy just off his, his, his house is on the shore of, of the loch. He used to go out and by lunchtime would catch enough cod for this village. Now if he went out he would probably have to stay out for about six months to catch enough cod for the, for the village. He would have to go offshore. Um, and it's, it's, it's great to have stories like that, that you realise how much we've lost and never forget what we've lost. Um, you know, people say the cod are back to the North Sea and come, come back into the North Sea. They've only come back to a heavily fished industry. You know, they've, they've finally got the biomass up to 150,000 tonnes. That's what it was in the 80s before they... So almost wiped them out. You know they got they got the biomass, the breeding biomass down to, uh, I think it was about fifty thousand tons, where it was ready to crash, um, and there are quite a few fishermen on the west coast that are aware of of that, but they they still are working under economic pressures, and they're working under the misapprehension of if I catch ten boxes and you only catch eight boxes, I'm better fisherman than you. He's just stayed out longer. He's just worked harder. And it's, it's, it's no big deal. <laughs> so, when you read the science and you see the, the videos of what happens when a dredge passes over the seabed, um, you see the before and afters, um, and you see the, the economic gain from the dredger, you just, it, it's just a ridiculous way to fish in, in the inshore waters. It's just a, Desertification of the seabed. Um, you've got you've got a seabed with grasses, with octopus. You got rash. You got um, sea grasses growing, and you've you've got a whole ecosystem that's all reliant on each other. And you know it's it's full of plankton. The 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 scallops are there, the the mussels, the crab, the 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 langoustine, and. It's, it's this sweeping, I've, I read a, a scientific paper saying that one pass of the dredge takes 41% of the sea life in that, in that track and it digs for 16 centimetres into the seabed. Now, no one's going to tell me that that is healthy. That's, that's a degrading of the environment to such an extent that the only thing that can happen in that environment is dredging. 
Whereas you can creel, you can line fish, you can dive, you can do all these different activities. You can you can have a sea angling activity. You can have a commercial angling activity where you can line catch fish and you can creel and you can dive all in the same area. Whereas a dredger comes along, all that, all that happens there after that is more dredging and more dredging. And you just, it's just degradation of the, of the ecosystem is, it's, if it was done ashore, it wouldn't, it wouldn't get anywhere near planning permission. But because it's in the water, not that many people know about it. They just eat the scallops. They're not too concerned about where the scallops came from. But for example, in the Apple Crescent, constantly you're getting, these are the best scallops we've eaten because they're hand dived. They're picked up off the bottom. They're not trawled along the, the bed in, a, in steel pins and iron rings and taken up after half an hour of being bounced along the bottom. They're just picked up, they're kept alive, they're sold to the the kitchen and they're obviously well cooked as well. But it's, it's that knowing that you're eating something that's sustainable adds to the taste and the, the good feel of the food. You're, you're honouring a, 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 a marine environment and I just don't think dredging should be allowed anywhere near the inshore waters. The inshore waters are where all the breeding takes place. All the fish come in. There's a whole cycle throughout the the year where the herring comes in in the in the spring. The cod comes in to eat the herring spawn. Then the after the cod, you get the all all the the the, the bottom sea life eating all the eggs, and that just gets swept aside. Um, so I I just don't think it's got a place inside and and certainly in the inner waters and that's only happened since the eighties so it's only a generation and a half then it's I for me it's a failed experiment um, there's the 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 prawn the the langoustine trawl and the scallop dredge needs far more area to survive and you would get far more boats working the same area in a spread of they wouldn't be so rich as the few that would trawl and dredge it. But if you had these, these creel boats, sea angling boats, they would they would make a good living from the same area. Um, and they would leave the place in a, in a far better state. Which is it's the whole point of it, is trying not to destroy the environment you're working in. Yeah, it's, it's you know, for example, you know, the, the, the prawn trawler, the, the, the longest day, the, so a prawns and langoustine are the same thing, you know, the Dublin Bay prawns, Norway lobster, langoustine. The langoustine is a, a, becoming the generic term for them. Um, the, the, the prawn trawler can get as little as 1,700 pounds a ton. And some, most of these small langoustine end up as scampi, breaded scampi. And you're probably tasting the, the, the salt in the bread, more breaded parts. And there's maybe even two tails in a one scampi the the langoustine that we catch is far bigger and it can be nine to ten to eleven thousand pounds a ton so the, the trawler has to catch five times as much and is is catching for a mass market and it's it, it's it doesn't make economic sense you know it's it's, it's pressuring that environment to catch more to get less for it and it's it's that sort of supermarket concept whereas if you were supplying your local fish market um, they would basically know the, the, the where the product came from and how well it was treated and you would get your market um, you know you would know your market whereas you know the supermarket anyone comes in goes down an aisle picks up a bag of frozen prawns and goes away home uh, doesn't know or almost doesn't care where they come from. Whereas, you know, the Alpacris Inn is, it's, it's a good place to supply uh, because we know the customer and most of the sea products have got a story. You know, the crab is caught out there and it's dressed in Alpacris and it's, it looks good and it's fresh. The langoustine, again, that's what we do. We catch them and we sell them in the, the inn. And, and you, know, you look at the langoustine and you know it's well cooked and it's fresh. And because it's so busy, it's it's a good product, and it's it's just not a mass market product. It's an experience, and and if you know what you're eating and how well it's caught and cooked, um, that's 
And the scallops, you know, the scallops are hand dyed. They're not dredged, you know, Jerry for many, many years has not bought any dredged scallops. And there'll be no scallops on the menu rather than have dredged scallops. And it's the same with prawn, uh, troll prawns, trolled langoustine. It's a different texture to the meat. You know, the meat is solid, it's good, it tastes well. And and it's a different market than this mass market, this supermarket sort of consumer society we're living in. Um, we don't claim to, to feed the world, um, but we can feed people that appreciate what they're eating. So I, I, I think we've made a big mistake in, in how we treat food, all food. Um, we base it on price now. And, you know, it, it seems to be, I, I saw something on social media in the last couple of days that Tesco are selling a whole chicken for £3.37. And the comment below it from a food writer was, what on earth happened to that chicken when it was grown and looked after and whatever? And and the pe people will buy it because it's £3.37. Um, it's almost as if, you know, it, it's... It's like buying a cushion cover that's really well made by someone that spent time in the design and put it together. It's going to cost £50. You can buy one in Primark or whatever for £10. Uh, the £50 one you still have in 20 years' time. Um, it's the same sort of logic for, for your seafood. If it's if it's something has is, is been well looked after, it's, I always go into, you know, you come from the Black Isle. I, I go into... Um, black Isle berries and I sort of always buy his strawberries, beetroot uh, tomatoes, raspberries all the things that I haven't got time to grow myself because I'm out catching langoustine and I know that his stuff, it, it tastes of strawberries, raspberries, beetroot you know and you go to the supermarket and you get something in a bit of plastic that's already been cooked, it could be anything and if 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 you have eat well you know, it's, it's, it's worth working for, you know, it's, people just dismiss the value of food so easily and it's, you know, having, sitting down to a good meal is, is a good part of your day and, and, and we sort of dismiss it, you know, we just have a quick hamburger and chips and whatever, you know, have, we're not hungry anymore, but, you know, to be, to eat, to be, to eat well, to know where that has come from, it, it means so much more. Um, corn fried chicken is far better and tastes far more than something that's been battery farmed um, it's like a wild salmon is tastes and looks so much better than a farmed salmon um, you know the omega 3 content is what it should be and it's no longer drops down by half when it's fed vegetable oils instead of you know of, uh, fish meal um, so it's it's logical you know, it's 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 good food, but it's we seem to have moved away from that for some reason. We're just so interested in saving money to spend it on a holiday. <laughs> it it gives me a lot of pleasure to to hear the comments from people that are actually surprised by how good the food is at the Albuquerque Inn. You know, they're genuinely surprised, and and it is it it's it's really good to be part of it, to be part of that production, um, and. I love being to see, you know, I, I do like everything about my job. And and then to see the end product, to see people's pleasure and eating the langoustine, eating the scallops, you know, it, I haven't, I don't, I don't know anything to do with the scallops, but, you know, serving them and knowing that the food is good and the provenance of the food is, is good. That is key to it. And, you know, the, and it's, it's well cooked and it's well looked after. And it's, it's this honoring the food. And that I like doing with our type of fishing is is so little wastage. Um, even when we keep the prawns, the, the langoustine, we keep them in crates over the side of the boat and until the market is ready, the hotel is ready to, to use them. And, you know, I'm losing just one prawn, you know, you feel bad about it because, you know, it's, 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 it's that wastage. But we keep our wastage down to, I'm sure, less than half of 1%. So, you know, it, it, that's part of the, 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 the reason why we work creels as opposed to instead of trawl. And, you know, that, that trawl method of catching the langoustine, there's so much wastage involved in it. Um, and even at, at the hotel, you know, we, it's, 
it's very frustrating to see so much uneaten food coming back into the the prep room where you put mail bucket after mail bucket of waste wasted food into you know the bin and you know we could feed I'm sure that that hotel feeds about maybe 300 to 400 people and it is probably enough food that comes back that would feed another 100 people um, and it's it's we were going back to the you know the the supermarket the system that we tend to live in um, it, it's geared up to convenience and the convenience means huge amounts of waste to get that nice looking packaged product on the shelf whereas you know the product tastes far better you know whatever it looks like if it's fresh better caught there's more of it about and it feeds far 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 more people um, but we, we, we just seem to be locked into this supermarket mentality of just going down to the shop everything's there and we throw it into a basket and go away home and we don't realize the provenance of the food you know the the effort that goes into either growing or producing catching um, you know it's, it's, it's an essential fuel of life and we just seem to have almost put that to the side and we were talking earlier about yeah the phone or the video or the Netflix or the telly is far more important than food you know we'll save money on food we'll not save money on Netflix um, and it's we've just got it the wrong way around um, food is something there to be enjoyed to to fuel your body to give you sustenance to go on to the next place and we just seem we, we've, we've missed we seem to have degraded that part of life and it's um, luckily there's places like the Albuquerque's Inn that do supply really good substantial food um, it's full of vitamins all the, the bits and bobs that you want and it's it comes from good sources all ah, right um, yeah it's it's a sort of as I wouldn't like to say I'm a disciple of the guy but I've read about uh, professor of marine, marine ecology at York University Colin Roberts and his book is called the unnatural history of the sea and it's really, really telling of, he's, he's picked up on something that's come from, I think the Californians in the 1970s, which talked about a, a degraded baseline, you cannot, a environmental baseline. And it's, it's the way it used to be. And he uses examples from, say, fishing competitions of 100 years ago, the size of the fish that was caught and the amount of fish. And he goes back even further into time where the first settlers came across to America and they landed in Chesapeake Bay in Virginia and they couldn't get ashore or close to the shore because of the, the amount of the oyster beds. The oyster beds were almost coming out of the water. There was oyster on oyster on oyster. And of course, that was an economic benefit. They realised, yeah, we'll have, we'll have oysters. We'll ice them up, put them in barrels and send them across to the West Coast. And before you knew it, you fished out the oysters in Chesapeake Bay but what they didn't realise at the time was the oysters had an environmental impact on the bay and they kept the, the waters filtered. And now Chesapeake Bay is, is mud and it's not as clean as it used to be. It hasn't got the environment it used to be. And of course, it has storm surges. They try to grow oysters in Chesapeake Bay and every now and again, a hurricane comes along and f flattens the oyster beds with two, three metres of mud and it wipes out that oyster farmer's livelihood. Whereas in the past, you had everything depending on everything else. And we just seem to knock out that chain of the environment that everything relies on something else, that relies on something else. And one of these days, we may knock out one of the vital chains, uh, vital links in the chain, and the whole chain collapses. I really hope we don't get to that stage, but it's that, that Chesapeake Bay oyster example is just how not to deal with a fishery.